Sister Rifa, thank you for the word of prayer. And I never take it for granted, this privilege, this honor to be in your presence. And, you know, this, had, you know, this was almost like pushing the envelope here, um, this topic. And I'm just asking, Almighty Father, I surrender, I submit everything to you this morning, Father God. Let the words of my mouth, let the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. Father God, thank you for using me as your oracle to deliver, to impart to my sisters and brothers this morning. Father God, let in my, the word that I share be meaningful and stir, stir within, within us, each and every one of us, and cause us to, to a call of action. So, Father God, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for providing this opportunity. This I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's such a joy, privilege, and, you know, I just hope and pray also, you know, that's what I've been hoping and praying that this is meaningful, you know, I share, and that God use it. We use it to transform each and every one of us and take us to that height that we need to be. It's like a plane, you know, when they take off. We don't want to be at a cruising altitude. We want to be soaring to new heights this morning. So Father God, I ask that what it is that I have to deliver will take us to new heights. And this morning, the scripture is coming from Titus 2, verse 11 to 14. I'm using the NIV version, and I'm going to give you a moment to bring it up, please. Okay, Titus 2, verse 11 through 15, reading from the NIV version. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled. Upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority, do not let anyone despise you. There ends the reading of the word. So I am speaking to you today about the topic of self-control and it's entitled Self-Control, The Journey Begins. And I'll get back um, to you with that. But first, let us define what self-control is. So while I was going through, um, I looked at the definition given by Merriam Webster, and it says, restraint exercise over one's impulses, emotions, or desires. And the Oxford edition said 
the ability to control oneself, in particular one's emotions and desires or the expression of them in one behavior, especially in difficult situations. And I just wanna speak to you about the word. It's called enkrateia. It's Greek. It's the Greek derivative for self-control and it's E-N-K-R-A-T-E-I-A, -E meaning the N, the E-N means infused or within. Kratos, K-R-A-T-O-S means vigor, dominion, power, strength, and having a great force within, but under control. So I just wanted to go back a bit and to start with the Beatitudes, right? Remember those in Matthew 5? Uh, the Beatitudes are what? When Jesus was given the Sermon on the Mount, he spoke about the Beatitudes. And one of the things that spoke about was the meek. And when I look through scripture, meek is also, it's associated with self-controlled. Normally, when we think of being meek, somebody being meek, we're a pushover, you mean meek and mild. We're a pushover. People can just walk all over us. But the Bible tells us otherwise. Being meek shows strength. And when you are meek, the Bible says in Matthew 5, and I look at the Amplified Bible translation because it speaks to this topic this morning. And it says, blessed, inwardly peaceful, spiritually secure, worthy of respect, are the gentle, the kind-hearted, the sweet-spirited, the self-controlled, for they will inherit the earth. They will inherit the earth. So... When we think about self-control, we all have different desires, impulses, compulsions. However, we have to take, I would be remiss if I did not look from the Bible, the exemplars, that are exhibited, depicting self-control. And I wanna start with Jesus. And I started with Jesus really because guess what? He should be first and he should be last. So I'll start with him and end with him. But when Jesus was in the wilderness, he was being tested by the devil. In Matthew 4, verse 1 to 11, we saw for 40 days and for 40 nights, Jesus fasted, he prayed. And we all can attest to this. We do get hungry when we do fast. Also, depending on the individual, we also can be physically weak. And just think about it. When we fast, we usually fast by drinking water or something just to keep us going. But when Jesus fasted, he didn't have any of that. He fasted, really fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. So when you are in that position, Jesus for lack of a better word, I would want to say vulnerable, but he didn't give in to his vulnerability at all. 
he was physically weak and he was hungry. And the devil, three different times, he tried to, he tested him. He tried to tempt him. In Matthew 4, verse 3, he said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Boy, what did Jesus do? Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So every word that proceeded from the mouth of God is what man should live by. That wasn't enough. So Satan took him to the holy city and have him stand on the highest point of the temple. And he says to him, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. In verse seven, Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay, the devil didn't stop there. Satan took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And in verse nine, he said, all this I give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. You know what Jesus did in verse 10? Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So then in verse 11, the devil left him and the angels attended to him. So, how many of us would be able under those conditions, under those circumstances, situation, have handled ourselves the way Jesus did. I fall short, so I know that. Jesus's flesh was weak from fasting, but what did he do? He demonstrated self-control by bringing things that could thwart everything. Everything that the devil came with, he was ready. And that his flesh was weak from fasting, but what did he do? He brought it under the subjection of God and did not yield to temptation. Jesus was so in tune with God that that Every way, every juncture, whichever way Satan came at him, he was able to resist him. How did he resist him? The word. He used the word as a weapon against Satan. He was able to combat, you know, Satan's plans. And this is what the devil does. He always is an opportunistic beast. He waits for an opening. And then he insinuates himself into our lives to cause us to sin and cause us to yield to the flesh and not demonstrate that self-control. Let's talk about Joshua. How Joshua listened to God. In Joshua 6, verse 2 to 5, the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. 
on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up and everyone straight in. In verse 10 to 11, we saw what Joshua did. Joshua commanded the army, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. So he continued this for the six days. And in verse 20, we see when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged again and they took the city. So Joshua exercised patience by waiting on the Lord. He was obedient to God's commission and how to lead the people to the promised land. What he did, Joshua followed God's instruction to the letter. He never once deviated from that path. Just think of it. As a military official, God's instruction, it doesn't make sense. Who trying to invade somewhere? and does that. Look at what's a case in point. Look at what's happening in, in Ukraine. Russia invaded Ukraine because they're trying to take over and they committed all types of atrocities. But look what happened here. God instruction did not make sense. If you're looking at it from a military and a strategic, you know, um, point of view but guess what Joshua never questioned and he never wavered so when we wait on God and we mobilize in obedience to him rather than go ahead with our own designs and strategies we are operating under his auspices and more importantly we are exhibiting self-control. We're not giving away to the flesh. We are operating under God's influence. We all know about David's story. And you know what? With David, we know there were times in David's life when he did not exhibit self-control. But the one that I want to bring to mind and let's revisit was when he spared Saul's life. And this is in 1 Samuel 24, verse 4 to 7. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul was able to leave the cave and went on his way. So we see how the opportunity presented itself, right? For David to have gone after Saul, but he did not. Remember the history. Saul was jealous of the love and the respect that the people had for David. And even though he was king, he had such jealousy towards David that he even started hunting David down 
just to end his life. That's what Saul did. But David could have dimmed his light. He could have taken him out, but he didn't do that because in obedience to God, right, he spared Saul's life. At that time, God wanted Saul to be king. He was chosen to be king at that time. And David recognized this. So he did not kill Saul. So we need to look at the importance of self-control. When we exhibit, when we demonstrate self-control, what does it do? It helps us to resist temptation because the temptations are going to come. What it does also, it prevents us from conforming to the enticements of the world because there are going to be things that out there that's going to seem attractive. But as a true believer, as a Christian, and following in the footsteps of God, we are not going to yield to that temptation. Self-control, it also guides our decision-making because we can, as human beings, God gave us free will to make decisions. We can make decisions that are going to glorify God, are going to, um, uh, decisions that are going to glorify God, decisions that are going to be the, that, you know, display the attributes of God. And it also corresponds with other fruits in our lives. What are the other fruits in our lives? We know they are love, joy, peace. Patience or forbearance. We have kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So when I said corresponds with other fruits in our lives, just think of, I give you one, think of patience. Does patience require self-control? Of course. Look at Joshua. Did he exercise patience? Yes, he waited on God. And in Proverbs 14, 12, it says, whoever is slow to anger has a great understanding and benefits from his self-control. When we talk about self-control also, it brings me to self-denial, denying ourselves, oneself. Denying oneself is a submission to God. Let me repeat, denying oneself is a submission to God. In Mark 8, 34, Jesus speaks to this. He said, if anyone wishes to follow me, they must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So self-denial is really the realization that we do not have to have our own way. You know the song that says, have thy own way, Lord. That's what we should be doing. It's not our way or the highway. Um, or, and another thing too, right? When we think about self-denial, in our 
you know, as mere man, we think once we engage in self-denial is that we're going to be unhappy. You know, things are just not going to go right with us, right? But I'm here to tell you that happiness is not contingent on us having our own way. Our happiness is not contingent on having our own way. Richard Foster spoke about love is denying oneself. In his book, Celebration of Discipline, he spoke about self-denial, meaning it's a freedom to give away to others. And we're going to hold others' interests above our, our own interests. So what happens when we don't practice self-denial? And one of the highest form, yes, of self-control is denying ourselves. When we don't practice it, what do we, what, what happens? We, 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 we beg and plead for things to go away. And when it don't happen, guess what? We revert to this pity party. It starts, the pity party starts where we're feeling sorry for ourselves, right? But guess what? Self-denial. Self-denial is the foundation of surrendering and submitting to God. That's what self-denial is. It's surrendering and submitting to God. So when, as believers, we have to operate differently, our responses to situations and circumstances cannot be like the rest of the world. We need to be led by the fruits of the Spirit. And Galatians 5, 22, 23 speaks to that. It says, I'm reading from the NIV, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So, God's presence, when we have God in us, Guess what happens? God's presence within us yields the fruits of the Spirit. I touched on patience or forbearance, but I saw something and I thought that was quite profound. Because we said we're being, we're waiting on God patiently, we're waiting on the Lord patiently, and we're forbearing, right? But I saw this and I said, wow, it really struck a chord within me because it says patience or forbearance is not the ability to wait, but is how we act while we're waiting. Because sometimes they say we're waiting patiently, you know, but guess what happened? We are murmur, we start murmuring and rumblings of discontent and malcontent, right? So it's not just waiting, it's how we act while we are waiting. That is true patience and forbearance. And when it comes on to the fruit of the Spirit, as it says in Galatians 5, 
there is no law against them. I couldn't touch on everything, but I, I would be remiss if I did not speak about pride. In Proverbs eleven twelve, it said, when pride comes, you have disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. And we know, we always talk about pride comes before a fall. What does pride do? It prevents us from recognizing our shortcomings and it hinders the growth of the other fruits of the spirit. Because pride, you know, won't allow us to be vulnerable. Pride won't allow us to show that we're not perfect. We put on this facade for everyone, this ear. That's what pride does. Proverbs 8.13. Oh, let me just back up. When we talk about it hinders the growth of other fruit spirits. That pride thing, it's deadly. It's one of the most deadliest thing. Because just think of it. You have nine fruits of the spirit. And pride alone can stop you from envel enveloping them, make it become part of your life and grow closer in your relationship, in your walk with God. Proverbs 8.13, it speaks to how God hates pride. It says it breeds arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. What pride does, even as believers amongst ourselves in the church, if we do not let go of pride, it can become so toxic to the life of the believer. What it does, it causes us to compete against one another. And it's not, it's not a healthy competition. It's more about defeating that person. So we have to send back pride into the pit of hell where it belongs. Maintaining, developing, and maintaining self-control. We know it's challenging. I struggle. And all of us struggle with some areas of it. Some more than others. But I'm here to remind us about the word in scripture. I am going to refer back to Galatians 5 about trusting and depending on God alone. Nobody else can do this. This is God's work. This is God's influence. This is kingdom work, not us. We have to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul's, Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 verse 2 that we have to walk in love. We got to walk in love. And how do we do that? We have to be imitators of God. Through his examples in his Bible, how does he demonstrate walking in love towards us? The ultimate sacrifice in giving is life for us. 
to save us from our trans transgressions. So as believers, we what we have to do, this is something we have to cultivate. This is something we have to embrace. This is something that we have to do. Giving ourselves to him and those around us. Because showing love to God and leaving our brothers and sisters out of it is not his example. So we have to do both. We have to practice the spirit of self-control. We got to renew our minds by delving into his word daily. Proverbs 28, 25, 28. It says that a man without self-control is like when a city is broken into when somebody just break into a city and the walls are down. That's what, when you don't have self-control, it's just free for all. And we know what happens when the wall come down and see, they think of it when they have rioting and stuff, you know, or they have a blackout or power outage, anything like that, right? People just go in and 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 and, and start to steal. You have the stealing and the marauding, and just think of it. We are like a city that is broken into with our walls when we don't have some self control. So what do we need to do? We need to protect our souls and display God to others because we have to be that beacon of light. We got to keep watch over the door of his lips as Psalm 141.3 says, right? We need to guard against unkind thoughts and not just thoughts, deeds. You know, we always say, we have a saying that engage brain before engage mouth. Because sometimes if, we not, if we're not deliberate and intentional in doing that, what happens? We say unkind things and we do unkind things to each other. We have to rule over our desires and impulses. You know, that id personality, as Sigmund Freud would say, right? You give in to the id, the id. The ego is the one who usually balances things out. But, you know, we have to have that instant gratification. And that's when we don't have self-control. That puts us into trouble because we want instant gratification. So, as I said before, we got to renew our minds and our souls. When we able to tra be transformed, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. What happens? In Romans 12, 2, it speaks about transformation of our minds, gives us the ability to be discerning in terms of what is good, acceptable, and perfect to God. Because we have to clear out the cobwebs in our mind. We have to filter out the toxic things. We have to pray for the help of the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and revelation in our knowledge of him. 
Ephesians 1, verse 16, 17 through 19, speaks to God giving us wisdom and knowledge of him. And this one, confess to God. This, this is the one, and I think a lot of us struggle with that. And we know we have to confess to God. And that comes easy to most of us. But the challenge is confessing to one another. But we have to do both. We cannot do one without the other. So we have to confess to God and one another. And this is about the challenges that we have, what we struggle with, what may be an hindrance to self-control. Let me remind you about 1 John 1, verse 7. about fellowshipping with one another so that blood of Jesus can cleanse all of us from all sins and unrighteousness. We must confess to God and one another. We know Everybody has triggers. And we've, we've often said, you know what? My pet peeve is this, my pet peeve is that. There are certain things that people are going to say and might say or do that is going to trigger us. We have to be mindful of that. It's not easy. But what we got to do we have to surrender to the old say, the old self is gonna, you say something, you mash my car, I'm gonna mash yours. That's what the old self is gonna let us do. And we're gonna practice that corrupt and go with the corrupt and deceitful desires of our heart instead of renewing our minds. Just remember. This is not a job for us to do it to it bigger than us. We can't take this on by ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit to reinvent us. No, this is the one that really touch, really touch me. The part, we gotta, remember nothing don't come without a cost, you know. Remember salvation come at a price. We have to be prepared to suffer. Be prepared to suffer. 1 Peter 4, verse 1. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Those that, and you know what happens why most of us fail self-control? Because <laughs> we believe it, it should not come at a cost. We just, we don't feel like we have to pay the piper. It doesn't work like that. Self-control, it's going to come at a cost. Because Jesus, he obeyed his father, right? And guess what? He was crucified. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come at a cost. Where they say, no pain, no gain. So whether it's an addiction, whatever it is that is we're struggling with, addiction, lust, 
sexual immorality or any kind of overindulgence, whether it is eating, overeating, or even shopping. We have to really, really invoke the power of the Holy Spirit. Another thing that we have to do is being very deliberate and we have to be thoughtful of others. When we interact with others, we have to be intentional in our interactions so we are not being mean-spirited, we're not being evil, and not only that, how do we react in response to others? Remember, a soft answer turns away wrath. Because sometimes our response can make a situation worse than it is. So let's just be mindful. So we know, you know, they always say teeth and tongue, teeth and tongue are going to make, right? Teeth and tongue are going to meet, right? However, how can we say we love each other and we keep fighting and quarreling with each other? So I want to call your attention to James 4, the book of James 4. where James 4 speaks about what causes conflict amongst each other. The number one thing, just I'm, I'm going to summarize this, but the number one thing that caused conflict and caused people to quarrel and argue is that usually persons, they want something and they don't get it. So it becomes a bone of contention. People even covet what other, others have even to the point of killing someone just to get it. But guess what? They don't have God in them because if someone wants something, right? And we know sometimes we want things, we desire things. But you know what? When we go to God and ask him for the desires of our heart, you know what, God, God, do a step further, you know. He will withhold from us the things that are not good for us. Because left to our own desires and our impulses, we are going to do things and go after the things that turns out to be self-destructive for us. But just remember that a lot of times when we don't get what we want is that we did not ask God. We did everything in our power to get it, but we never put him first. We never put it to him and seek him and say, God, this is what I long for. This is what I want. But Father God, you know best. You don't hold back what is good from your daughter or your son. Another thing that people do, boast and brag. That causes conflict because if a person is a bragger, are they constantly boasting about something? 
the other person is going to at some point say something and it's not going to be nice. So, and that person is going to take offense to it. So that can cause conflict or quarreling, slandering one another. It's evil and it's a sin. When we have conflicts as believers, we can't, you, you know, a lot of times what we end up doing, we try to take on God's work. But when there's a problem or there's an issue with any of our brothers and sisters, all we need to do is put it at his feet and just ask God to intervene and ask God to do his work as he see fits because he never makes mistake. You don't pray for anything bad for that person. You just put the situation before God and God will always make a way. And when he make a way, no one else can block that. And he can mend relationships. He can resolve conflicts. We have to recognize also that we cannot have our cake and eat it too. We cannot have our cake and eat it too. It's either God or the world. We cannot say we have God and we are in the world doing what our hearts desire, what we please and, and no. So just remember, friendship with the world is hatred toward God. And James, in the book of James, Chapter 4, it speaks about that. Friendship with the world is hated. It's an hatred toward God. Remember, I said I would get back. So the topic of self-control, the journey begins. And I entitled it that. And it's a personal decision why I entitled it as such. Because when I looked at and I really thought about it and I went through and I was looking at self-control. For me, I am not there. So I realize I am on a journey. I am on a journey. And, you know, I, it's something where I realize that I have to bring myself, we have to bring ourselves under the power of Christ. We have to ponder. We have to pray. We have to invoke the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not a job that we can do by ourselves. This is God's work. So this brings me to two important questions for us, myself included. And I only chose two questions for the simple reason that 
I felt that these were really important. You know, um, so the first question is, what aspects of your personal Christian walk require more self-control and discipline? I know I'm on a journey. So I started on my journey. It has not ended. I'm still traveling. So question one, what aspects of your personal Christian walk require more self-control and discipline? Secondly, I was deliberate. I did not ask what steps. This is how I put it. It's a statement. It's not a question. You know, I should, yeah, the first one is a question. The second one is piggybacking on that question. So it's not a question. It's a statement because it's a must do act. So the statement is the steps you are going, myself included, to ensure that you apply self-control to those areas identified. So the first is a question. The statement piggybacks on that question. I did not make it a question because it's a call, it's a call to do, it's a call for action. So we all have to make a plan. What steps, what interventions, what strategies are we gonna put in place to ensure that self-control is applied to any of the areas that we identified? Where we require more self-control and discipline, which areas are those? So we have to deliberately search ourselves, do some introspection, ponder, reflect, ruminate on it, and actually put pen to paper or type it, whichever way that works. Write those down. And the steps that you and I are going to ensure that we apply self-control in those areas. So we've seen how God, how Jesus' life has exemplified self-control We've seen the exemplars in the Bible of people who have surrendered, submit to God, and self-control. The fruit of the spirit of self-control is evident in their lives and in the actions and the decisions that they have made. So this morning, this afternoon, we, the ball is in our court. Are we going to be active participants? Are we just going to be spectators? Are we going to be doers of the word? Or are we just going to be readers of the word? I know it's very challenging. And there are hindrances. Things that can really derail us. But as I said, 
We got to seek God first. We have to have that conversation with God. Because when we do not practice, when we don't exercise self-control, we are departing from the ways of God. And not only um, how self-control impacts and negatively, we're not talking positive impacts here, negatively impacts the other fruits of the spirit. We cannot love the way we should without self-control. Because that means with that love, we have to deny ourselves and put others first. Without self-control, we're not able to exercise patience. Patience with one another. And more importantly, we're not going to be patient waiting on God. Remember, it's not just waiting. It's what we do while we're waiting. How do we react in that waiting period? Are we murmuring? Are we whining? Are we saying, God, hurry up now, wait, it takes so long. Are we doing that? In terms of joy, that inner peace, without self-control, we can't. Because we want that inner joy, even when things are not going well in our lives or around us. We have that inner peace from joy because of a surrendered life to God. Kindness. How do we extend kindness to someone when we do not exhibit self-control? Sometimes it might have, it means doing without, but giving to that person who might have a greater need. That's what kindness is. Or even if you don't realize they have a greater need, it's just doing it. Sometimes it could be by words or deeds. Someone is not having so, such a great day. You offer words of kindness and hope to that person. How about faithfulness? Faithfulness. We have such a great example. God has been so faithful to each and every one of us. And I don't think there's anybody on this line or this platform that can say any differently. Just the mere fact that he gave us breath. He woke us up this morning, spared our lives. We're in our right minds. That's grace and mercy extended towards us. Being faithful because he never leaves us and never forsakes us. Gentleness. Being gentle. Not everyone, you know, can be gentle. Because being gentle is sometimes, we, you know, people, somebody just irritate us to a point where you're so irritable that your tone, your demeanor might be very harsh. Or you want to 
you know, point something out to someone that you think that they should be doing or they're not doing, but the way you did it in, in a manner so gentle that they don't even realize that you are correcting them just because of how you did it. It's not what we say, it's how we say it. So my brothers and sisters, I wanna thank you for your time and listening. And I hope that my presentation today has been edifying. Thank you.